welcome to Therapist Spotlight. Hello everybody and welcome to Anta's Therapist Spotlight, the podcast where we aim to showcase our wonderful members to the wider community to bring awareness to natural medicine and what it can do for the health space that we're in. I'm your host Joshua Brooks and today we've got the lovely Julie Malay with us. Julie is a holistic nutritional consultant that specializes in native natural food. So this is going to be a fantastic conversation. So Julie, how are you today? Hi, good, thank you. How are you? I'm wonderful. So the inaugural question, what got you into natural medicine? Well, um, I'm a nature lover by by nature. (laughs) Yeah, I just um, have always had an interest in plants and animals and wanting to protect them and um, I've had lots of animals myself as well as a farm. Um, just grew up in Melbourne, eastern suburbs, and, uh, yeah, just used to walk through paddocks with horses. And I think my mother also, she always went to a naturopath um, who was about 90 years old, and I always found that fascinating, the things mm. that mum used to come back and tell us around the kitchen table. We always were passionate about food in our family. I've got an Italian background, so it was always some days with big long tables and it was all about beautiful food and bringing people together. So I guess that's going back quite a longer way um, of why I do what I do. But really the natural therapist um, thing clicked with me about 25 years ago mm-hmm. and I thought to myself what do I really want to do that I'm passionate about and that I have a really good connection with and that was food and Mm. health I always loved um, uh, science at school and uh, so just bringing those two things together and naturopathy was just a natural choice of modality that I went down that path and studied for four years Mm -hmm. Um, about 10 years after that I studied um, nutritional medicine Oh, so, sorry, I studied um, human nutrition. Mm-hmm. Um, along the way, I was thinking about what plants grew around me and that kind of my train of thought was um, what native foods there are and how did Indigenous people survive off these foods for, you know, even perhaps 70,000 years or more. And that's just sparked um, a natural... Uh, yeah, spark in me about you know what did they survive off what nutrients were there in the foods that um, what food groups were there you know how did they combine them so I just went on this journey of just picking up um, books at the time and reading them and just started building up you know a stack of books about native foods and indigenous culture because you can't separate the two Um, And then about 10 years ago, I went on to study nutritional medicine and I knew all along then that I would be bringing in the bigger picture about native Mm -hmm. foods into that when I'd finished the the course that was at, um, the naturopathy was at Endeavour and then the um, other one was at the AIAS Mm -hmm. in Melbourne. Um, After I did the naturopathy, I went on to live in a a culinary medicinal herb farm in country Victoria. Oh, wow. And I was, it was after I uh, finished the naturopathy and I just went away the weekend with my two boys and, and they were like, oh, there's a, a herb farm around here. Let's go and visit. And as soon as we stepped out into the veranda, I just looked over at the cathedral ranges because I'm very drawn to rocks <laughs> and mountains. <laughs> and I just looked at them and I just knew that, we would be here one day. I don't know what it was. <laughs> um, and we approached the owner and we said to her, we just want to buy your farm. You know, we love it as a throwaway line. <laughs> and after we had um, a cup of tea with her, she said, well, it's for sale. And it had that mature plants of ginkgo biloba, echinacea. It had culinary herbs galore, like about wow. 50, including some native herbs. And I mean, we just dropped everything in Melbourne. We went to live there um, with our two sons who were around eight and 11 at the time. And we thought that's it. We want to teach them about nature, living off the land. We had no TV for almost three years. 
Um, they built belly carts. We grew our own food. We lived the naturopathic way. And I, I just love that we did that and we dropped everything. We, had, we drank the rainwater. We planted our own fruit and vegetables. We had our own chickens and other animals, but we didn't kill them. <laughs> we couldn't do that. But, yeah, we went into the state forest and heated our house with the wood, which, you know, when we were baking in the oven. So we just lived that naturopathic way. And, and I know that now that that's in my children as well mm. and it's passing on that uh, way of living to them. And I can see now they've got their, um, one of them's got a child as well and that will be passed on to her, that naturopathic kind of way of thinking. Mm. Um, as far as my professional life goes, I am a bit of a native food nutritionist. Um, that's the area that I'm specialising in at the moment. Um, well, for the last six years, um, yep. I've set up NATIVE, which is an acronym for Native Australian tra Traditional Indigenous Foods. Um, it's, it's funny how it just landed on my lap, that name NATIVE wasn't available and we went, okay, NATIVE. My husband's French and it happens to be um, NATIVE in French is NATIVE. I don't know. So things That's just work cool. out yeah. sometimes. It's a bit weird. Yeah. Um, yeah. So now I'm living and breathing my dream. I travel around the country. I visit growers um, and harvesters. I connect with Indigenous people and their businesses. I'm an mm. auntie to a lot of Indigenous people around the country. Oh, yeah. So it's, and it's such an honour. And we help establish Indigenous um uh, people with the Kakadu Plum, we're sort of part of a team that works with a university mm. and a charity foundation to set up a traditional homeland enterprise. I mean, they do mainly that, but I create like a supply and demand, just drawing and advertising for people to use more native foods because the bigger picture is that back on the land in the outback there are indigenous people that want to grow it and want to make a living out of it mm. which has incredible roll-on effects for the communities through employment business opportunities being able to share their own ip and intellectual um, stories around their traditional foods mm. um, so that's been a major passion for doing what i do we've been a not-for-profit for about four years and now we're mainly a social enterprise because I realise that I do have to make a bit of money out of my living. And, um, yeah, just to even just have a salary. So I salary sacrificed for about four years doing what I did um, when I was at my poorest, actually. <laughs> um, yeah, we'd, my husband had lost his job and we'd had to sell our house and moved you know, downscale. And so I've done it hard. I've mm -hmm. had a couple, about two or three jobs that was supplying income um, at oh, the wow. time. So it wasn't an easy path yeah. that I took and it was definitely something that I knew would be part of a bigger picture. It would get political, it would get complicated, you know, with the Indigenous mm. people wanting to come in and, and go, hang on a minute, you're not Indigenous. Um, so in the sure. beginning, I made sure that I spoke to Indigenous elders and about mm. what I wanted to do and got their permission that was really a gut felt wrenching mm. thing to me at first. I was a little bit lost in the beginning. But um, yeah, I think if your intentions are good, they see that and that's really important. It wasn't really a money making thing for me. It was more about just following my passion and having this incredible, mm. strong feeling that um, this was going to be part of a bigger picture and I had to be involved um yeah to get it going and promoted and uh, so now i'm a wholesaler I'm a, um one of the industry's wholesalers i we supply to um home cooks yeah just at home we supply to masterchef australia now yeah wow well. we're a wholesaler um so we supply food and beverage com companies nutraceutical mm -hmm. pharmaceutical businesses um, yeah, food and beverage and also gin companies that are wanting to use it. And as you know, it's got its fame at the moment. Everybody wants to use native ingredients. So we even work mm. with startup businesses. We've got no minimum order quantity 
um, if they want 20 grams to start with to create some sort of product, we're happy to um, to do that with them. So we we did start off at Farmer's Market mm-hmm. um, in Bayside, Melbourne. We did the hard yakka for over a year. Then we ended up doing a collaborative event in Federation Square where we brought down Indigenous people from the Wadai community that were working in um, country Victoria at a cafe um, for hospitality. So we bust them down so that they could be part of the stall. So that was an amazing experience for them. We did that with the Kindred, Kindred Spirits Enterprise who funded them to be able to come to the event. And mm-hmm. again, we spoke to um, lots of people at Fed Square about Native Foods and what our intention was with the industry and how everybody could get in on board um, you know, to be part of, I mean, without the supply and demand, there's no industry. So everybody, you know, should really embrace them, not just because they're Australian native superfoods, but also Mm -hmm. because they're just part of this beautiful bigger picture. And you, by eating native foods, it brings people together at the table. And then we're able to share, um, you know, stories about, not their intellectual property, that's one thing I do not do, mm. um, but just share, you know, where did, where did they come from? Indigenous people were here for thousands of years, you know, how did they um, negotiate amongst each other? Um, mm. How did they trade these foods? How did they survive off them? What did they eat in certain seasons? Mm. You know, there were six seasons in most parts of Australia. Mm-hmm. And then there's the mm-hmm. ugly truth about the you know, the history, the colonisation and how what we really see today in the Australian landscape isn't how it was. And often mm-hmm. I speak to Indigenous um, women from different, you know, Jaja Warren country in different parts of the country and, and I say, oh, you know, what was it like? You know, what did it look like? Then they said, certainly not what it looks like now. And a lot of the foods that were available at the time just aren't there anymore. Mm-hmm. So this is also part of the bigger picture, the sad part that um, with agriculture, you know, we've really ruined the land and we've um, discontinued a lot of um, the traditional methods of taking mm. care of land, the fire burning, the um, just the maintenance and, you know, how Indigenous people used to plant out a lot of the country. So the landscape, we need to give credit to the Indigenous people because they didn't just wander around hunting and gathering, they were qualified horticulturists really in their own right and botanists. And they had totems where they cared for the, you know, that whole connective experience around that native food to protect it for future generations. And I think it's just a big lesson for us, um, Mm. for anyone in the world really about how to manage land and how we're inseparable from nature and that we really need to so i love the indigenous culture and all of their Mm. um their ways of how they've done things in the past but there's a big rise in indigenous participation in the australian native foods and botanical industry at the which, you know, there was, you know, quite a few years ago, but now it's coming at up of around 10%. So they're clicking on to, my God, this is the time where they can start to share and create products and do more things with their own mm. traditional food. So, yeah, yes. what we've been doing is working and <laughs> we love collaborating with their businesses. And, yeah, it's just a joy to be in the industry at the moment. But, yeah, it's pretty tough as well. Like there's a lot yeah. of negative things going on. and But um, we just need to stick with it and, you know, mm. persist and but put out a very positive, um, yeah, aspect about what's going on and, mm. yeah, which it is. Well, you're, you're definitely speaking to my soul, that's for sure. Like nature um, connection is a massive, massive passion of mine. Um, and wild crafting, I absolutely love, you know, and I think from my own personal perspective, and I'd love to hear your take on this, it's like the whole naturopathic viewpoint of the cure sort of grows near the near the disease, you know, so the classic one is poison ivy and jewel weed, right? 
And so I often think that that's possibly a broader perspective. So like native foods really connect us to the land, but it also connects us to the seasons of the place and it connects us to possibly seasonal diseases or seasonal changes. The food starts to grow to help our bodies to navigate those seasonal changes because you know the plants are there and we've got to come into this co-creative harmony with nature and that's to me the proper way for sustainability or future sustainability um what do you think of that's that sort Absolutely. of concept i'm a hundred percent with you it definitely and and that's another reason why the whole native foods is such a important thing for us to embrace because of mm. that because you know, we live in Australia, we live in a harsh climate, mm -hmm. which is getting harsher, as we know, with climate change. And so the, the, the Mother Earth is providing what we need for where we live. Mm -hmm. You know, if you live in Melbourne, you should see what foods there are in Victoria that mm -hmm. are appropriate to um, us living here. And then that will affect our health in a positive way because the the plants have survived because of the harsh environments and have con um, constructed constituents in that plant according to the location. Mm -hmm. So we are connected to that location. So then when we eat that plant, it's going to provide us with the superfood benefits of where we live. If you live in Queensland, then there'll be, you know, lots more um, really different native food plants mm -hmm. up there like Davidson plum and, um, Illawarra plum and you know mm. just massive amounts of other foods and even seafoods and pr other proteins that you'll need according to that climate that you live in and that's one thing when um you look at the native map of Australia and you see all the you know hundreds of language groups mm. they would have operated in various micro climates you know, within Australia, you know, we don't divide it up into the state. I don't see Australia as the states that we live in at the moment when I'm thinking of native foods and natural therapies. I'm thinking of the the different language, that colourful, beautiful map that shows mm -hmm. all the different parts. And, um, you know, just looking at, I mean, we, we do live in a world now where we have access to, you know, global foods, but I tend to try to eat the foods from Australia and just pick out, you know, different superfoods that are all around Australia and eat those. So I am eating foods that are Australian around the country. Um, yeah, and then I've got, you know, my Italian background. So I still love to cook because that's my heart and soul. That's where I come For from. For sure, that's yeah, definitely. Too. Mm -hmm. And that's where you can marry the native foods because genetically mm -hmm. my ancestry goes back to, you know, to Europe. So my body also um, can incorporate the fact of where I live and you can, I think it's okay to marry the two and that has a, I find that when I eat more European food and I incorporate native foods as well, mm -hmm. for some reason my body responds better to yeah, that. Yeah, definitely. And I've realised, okay, I'm not an Aboriginal person. Um, I'm also, you know, have other cultures in my genetics so then that's okay you know it must be mm -hmm. okay naturally for me to eat that way mm -hmm. so and and that just brings out a real other beauty in like if you were Chinese or Indian or Vietnamese or whatever nationality you are because we live in a global world incorporate the native foods into your mm -hmm. diet holistically um, because you don't want to give away your tradition and just go, okay, I'm Australian, I'm just going to embrace Australian food because it's just not like that. And that's not yeah. the reality anymore. And, sure. and, you know, we can't go back thousands of years to, you know, uh, eat exactly the way um, Indigenous people ate because the landscape is totally different as well and the climate has changed. And, you know, there's been all these other variations which we have to consider. But I think if you're just in tune with yourself, who you are, if you're mm. in tune with your environment and your country and, you know, you just embrace all those things, I think there's a modern way of incorporating foods into your diet. But Australian native superfoods are actually real superfoods. Like they have been studied by the rural industries, by CSIRO, 
Um, most of the universities around Australia at the moment mm. are studying native foods and they're just showing to be, you know, having much more um, health benefits than, say, the other common native foods. Um, sorry, the other common um, health foods like we think of as the avocado or the blueberry, and they're showing to be higher, you know, sources of lutein, which is good for eye health and yeah. um, other vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients, mm. antioxidants, just the whole works. You know, they're going off the charts. Mm. So it's a very exciting time to be in the native foods and botanical industry for that reason. And definitely the pharmaceutical and nutraceutical, cosmeceutical companies are hovering over the whole industry at the moment. There is a supply and demand issue, though, and that's going to hold the industry up a little bit and export and all of that. Mm. So I'm a member of ANFAB, which is the Australian Native Food and Botanical Industry. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to, um, you know, just sort out all the barriers that there are to markets, which will hold up. It's going to take quite some time and quite a few years. But on the foraging note, as you were saying before. Yeah, my favourite. <laughs> that because I do tend to go off on, you know, the patient <laughs> side of it. Um, but, yeah, I think we do have to be careful because more people mm. are realising now, oh, my God, there's free food out there. Mm. Um, we need to be very mindful of, you know, the environment, you know, leaving enough food there for the birds mm -hmm. and, you know, going back into the soil, which is the nutrients back for the plant itself to provide. Um, you know, we live in times now where we can purchase these foods mm -hmm. and um, from a, an array of businesses and I would highly recommend supporting Indigenous mm -hmm. businesses in this area as well and um as well as my own business i have to plug my own native 100 oh, so, <laughs> um but yeah but being mindful with foraging mm. just not taking too much of it you know than what you can just enjoy foraging for you know sometimes i do pick a little bit of samphire and i bring it back and i'll cook with it at night time but i'm just very mindful about the quantities that i'm picking and whether there's a surplus of it in the area, you know, yeah. so I'm analysing, yeah, you know, foraging, but I do love foraging. And I've just recently come back from a 16,000 kilometre trip last week. Wow. I went around Australia in our camper van and, um, yeah, we went to a lot of different national parks. That's my, yeah, my happy place is a national mm -hmm. park. Um and yeah, I've I've got my own database of foods, my own pictures, mm. my own IP that I've literally I think it's twenty two years worth. Um, so yeah, I don't like to take intellectual property and um, tell stories of what Indigenous people say, and I don't like to use their traditional medicine methods in my business because that's mm -hmm. that belongs to them we have to leave a space for them if we you know as a professional you know nutritionist and there's other professionals out there we do really have to be mindful so if i can just give this message out to other practitioners to be mindful not to tell their story, leave that space for them because we've got a lot of catching up with the industry before we can export and, you know, really make it grow. And if we tell everything about what they've told us and they will trust us with it, um, it's just not fair. And there are legal implications for it into the future because there are native food and indigenous lawyers that are working at the moment in protecting their IP. So just be very mindful and careful where we're treading and mm. definitely look up. Um, I'll, I'll put a couple of links on my website actually where you could um, just, you know, just so that you can investigate for yourselves and do your own research around that area. Mm. Um, yeah, about telling your stories and leaving that space for them. But definitely tell your own story. Like I, I do my own research and you know, I've just spent the last three months on country, you mm -hmm. know, foraging and um, investigating. And then I've still got a lot of, yeah, going back, you know, to those plants and looking them up and mm -hmm. finding about them. But another thing that may, may interest the natural therapists watching is that 
for SANS um, Food Safety Australia and New Zealand have always listed these foods as novel foods. So they've been on the novel foods list, you know, most of them for years, but they're starting to release them so that we can create nutritional panels with them. Yeah. Um, that's always been a big headache for me. I've come through probably the hardest part of being in the industry where I had to navigate it all on my own. And it was not easy, one, to find the foods, find the Indigenous you know, people to work with and find the nutrition information that I needed. Um, but, yeah, I mean, we do, I, do, I am starting a native food consultation mm -hmm. um, on my website now where if native therapists want to um, know how to navigate the industry, mm -hmm. where to find information, I'm happy to pass on that knowledge. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there will be a, a fee involved or a half hour free consultation, mm -hmm. on, you know, narrowing down what you really need to know. And then, um, yeah, just another way I've got to provide income um, to my business because it is very hard to generate income from mm -hmm. the native foods industry. Mm -hmm. um, I would yeah, just... just the nature of where it sits at the moment. Yeah, I do just have one question and for me it is a um possibly a philosophical problem and i'd love i'd love actually love your take on it mm -hmm. so when we were talking about foraging right when we're taught foraging properly it's like you always leave enough of the plant so that it can regrow so that it can keep going so that what you do is you know you you don't just go and take a whole dandelion you may take two or three leaves but then the plant can regrow so you always are mindful that you're not overtaxing the land mm -hmm because it's not a resource, it's there to help us. And we have to become like, I keep talking to people about like this co-creative harmony with nature. So learning sustainability, that's, you know, the proper way. And where I always get a little bit worried or nervous is when we start talking about nutraceuticals or we start talking about um, potentially building supplements is that maybe that sort of ethos will get lost a little bit. And then it becomes a bit more of a resource that we can harvest a whole bunch of leaves produce it, make this nutraceutical, make this pill without potentially respecting the land and that foraging um, ethos of leaving enough there. How have you noticed with that industry now when people maybe are coming down to it? And do you think that the nutraceuticals are a good idea or do you think that keeping them as whole foods that we forage would be a better approach to using these native superfoods in the future? What's your opinion on that? Yeah, I hear you. Um, so I think it, it'd be lovely to think that these, the Australian landscape had, mm -hmm. you know, just an abundance of wild native foods. Having seen it for myself and been around the country from the outskirts into the deserts and everywhere, mm -hmm. it's not the case. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, they're very few and far between. And so you may get pockets of native foods where, you know, you'll see an abundance of that species growing. Mm. Um, but in reality, you know, we have agriculture that's taken over most of the land, except for the real true outback, you know, um, mm. which there's a lot of land out there that's very, you know, it's got native plants, but not necessarily native foods. I mean, even mm. kangaroos won't be there because there's just not much to eat. Yeah. So I think it would be great to always say, okay, they're wild harvested. You know, like, mm -hmm. well, let's take kakadu plum, for example, because mm -hmm. that's a really great one that the pharmaceutical and nutraceutical industries are definitely have been using and cosmeceutical industry has been using over the past 10 years and that's definitely a developed um, industry. Although when you do go there, you see how primitive it is, the whole mm. process, like they're literally out in their cars with the women and children, there's snakes around, there's long grass, the trees are, are just endemic up there. You know, there's so many kakadu plum trees. Mm. And um, so, that's a wild harvested, mainly a wild harvested mm. ingredient, but there are plantations um, that have just started over the last couple of years because we realised that you can't just forage and strip the back the 
the plants there's just too much and the, the supply that the farm that industry needs mm, is, mm. will just far outweigh of what there is on the land and even at the moment how much we can supply by plantations um yes yeah, so what there is at the moment in the wild we definitely need to leave it we need to move from this foraging and wild harvesting into plantations not so much on traditional homeland enterprises um, or, or native title land because that's their land you know and there's lots of it and it can still be wild harvested indigenous people do know how to harvest without stripping back the tree and mm -hmm. what percentage to leave back on it mm -hmm. so they're naturally aware of that but unfortunately money talks and we've seen you know i've got a lot of indigenous friends up there and um who are on land harvesting their own plums on their land and we're seeing a little bit of that being abused mm -hmm. you know that's just human sure. nature it doesn't mm. matter who we are and unfortunately you know we've got to make sure that that that's just sustainability and the ethics are there but there's a monitoring of those mm. processes and that's why i get in my car and we drive the thousands of kilometers because i want to see what's happening and you know what their thoughts are and whether they're doing the right thing and you know like for me purchasing it i can't purchase something that's you know unethical or unsustainable yeah, it just doesn't go align with my values so that's where we have to do the mileage and get out there mm -hmm. um, but yeah definitely even the indigenous growers that i know you know really great businesses mm -hmm. um some of them are horticulturists as well as using their traditional knowledge and yeah. They, they, they could be hot housing at some of them and they're doing, you know, growing, but they do have methods where they, maybe they won't grow them in lines. Mm -hmm. When you grow food in lines, the plant's not struggling. It's being fed, spoon fed, you know, it's mm -hmm. being watered, it's being catered to. So that plant right. doesn't have to struggle. And it's in the struggle of the plants where they start to produce these superfood components. Yep, 100%. Methods of, we have to rethink the methods of how we're um, planting these foods and maybe look at nature and, and do mm. a density check, you know, maybe randomly, you know, throw them out so that um, they need to struggle a little bit and lure the hard way. It's a bit like um, tough parenting. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Plants. And it's one of my favourite, like, permaculture ideas is where you get just a mud ball and you put your seed in it to it and you just throw the mud ball wherever you want and yeah because again the whole biggest thing is when you actually start to look at ecosystem science nature has so many variables that we don't even know we don't even know right like there is so much that is just going on behind the scenes that like i mean just even the latest you know five or ten years with mushrooms and the fungal mycosal networks that we didn't even really know about for a long time so it's like there's so much unknowns that i think to think that we've got it all figured out and we can bend nature to our will sometimes i think it's a bit of hubris that we maybe need to learn <laughs> yeah i'm with you <laughs> yeah, definitely and and that's going to be huge because we need to um you know learn from the mistakes of you know what we're doing stripping the land stripping the microbiome you know mm -hmm. biome of the land it just goes so soil deep you know yeah. to environmental universal aspects and it's massive and we should just let go and let the universe you know and the land and um you know that's I me ideally speaking oh, yeah, yeah you know yeah. if only we could just learn and let go maybe we wouldn't create such a problem for ourselves if we embraced um the natural methods more and um but well, you know that's hard because of systems I always think that it's are a, already in place well i always think it's a dance isn't it and if you've got a dancing partner you, you know you don't force the dancing partner you work with them and that's the way i always think that this sort of environmentalism has to work is we need to dance with nature and you know mm. respect nature and respect what it's got and then respect ourselves and come into that co-creative harmony with it where we can work together not you know not dominate it or bend it or anything like that but I'd just like to thank you so much, Julie, for coming on. This has been absolutely yes. a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you too. So just where can people find you? Um, we'll obviously put the links, like always, we'll link it underneath. But just quickly, where can people find you? Where can they connect with you? 
Um, and where's your clinic sort of space and what are you doing? Yeah. Yep. So I work out of a co-share workplace with about another over 80 businesses and it's called mm-hmm. Click Collective in Moorabbin in Victoria. And um, yeah, I'm, it's, I think it's one of a kind in Australia. It's an e-commerce facility. So we have a you know communal reception area, communal e-post, you know, pack pick post mm-hmm. parcel collection area with incoming and outgoing goods. I'm currently sitting in an office, um, one of three, uh, actually one of five now, because they've um, enhanced the facilities here. Um, little boardroom meeting rooms. There's a couple of I- podcast studios. I didn't know how to use them, otherwise I could have used it today. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we get big truck semi-trailers pulling because there's some really big companies right down to little new startups here. So we have our own little rooms, um, uh, offices, but they're also warehouse spaces as well. Yeah, awesome. Um, which means I can travel around Australia and I have um, a fantastic lady called Virginia. Mm. Um, she's a very big environmental activist as well as yeah, an incredible scientist for marine mm. um, life. Yeah, and she works with me when I'm traveling around and does all the hands-on stuff here, but I still work really hard from my computer no matter where I am in Australia. So we have this beautiful harmony going on together. I can also use these rooms for consultation rooms, for Mm -hmm. nutrition, um, you know, natural therapies and um, just board meetings in general. So, yeah, I've, I've got a lot of different avenues in which I work. We supply research material, native food research material to universities for research. So we're involved in that as well. Sometimes we have to work out the provinces that they want, um, you know, in source, you know, get in touch with all our suppliers and growers and get that species in so they can use it for the future. But yeah, the facility I'm in at the moment is just a wonderful place where I can actually be who I want to be and um, work out of with complete confidence in yeah the whole supportive community here yeah, yeah which great, we great. share knowledge but definitely if you um, go to native.com.au so native mm-hmm. n-a-t-i-f for food yep. um yeah you can contact me there and i'm happy to um you know consult with anybody wanting to know a bit more about this space and wanting to get into this space. Mm -hmm. It's definitely rewarding. It's challenging. It's not easy, but it's definitely a passion and a love. Excellent. Well, we'd just like to say thank you so much for coming on and sharing your wonderful self with us. It's been absolutely beautiful. And yeah, for anybody out there who's interested in the native Mm -hmm. food and native nutrition, please give Julie a call and connect up and we'll see where this can go. But other than that, thank you so much for coming on Therapist Spotlight. Thank you. Yep. Thank and you. for everybody out there, we'll catch us all next time. Bye, See everyone. Bye. <laughs> Speak soon, hopefully. Thank you for listening to Therapist Spotlight. If you would like to know more about ANTA, visit us at www.anta.com.au.